Good evening. Welcome to Global Dialogue, a program dedicated to an understanding of global events and activities from the local point of view, from a local participant's point of view. Tonight, my guest is Professor Mayfair Young. Professor Young is the director of the Confucius Institute at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Now, it might be a little strange, I think, for us to hear that, that there is a Confucius Institute at the university. Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't it be more appropriate to have that institute somewhere in China? Well, the Confucius Institute uh, there is a, uh, a phenomenon of the past um, 12, uh, 14 years or so. And it's funded by the Chinese government Ministry of Education. And there are about uh, over 400 Confucius Institutes around the world mm -hmm. uh, in almost every country of the world. Um, and um, it uh, serves to promote the understanding and the study of uh, Chinese culture, history, and society. So we have one now at uh, UC Santa Barbara. and. Um, so one of our um, roles is to promote the learning of Chinese language. So we have a Chinese language instructor sent to us to uh, be integrated into our existing Chinese language program at UC Santa Barbara in the East Asian uh, Languages and Cultural Studies Department. So this is a Chinese instructor who's sent from China, by China. Correct. She's to... uh, from Shandong University, which ah. is our partner university in China. Yeah. Well, yes. that's, that's very interesting. Now, the Chinese uh, government is the sponsor of this event. And so uh, why do you think they, they want to put forward the name Confucius? Okay, so Confucius is an ancient sage who lived in the 6th century BCE, and um, he's had a tremendous impact uh, over so much of Chinese history the last 2,000 years. Now, he hit upon some hard times in the modern era, uh, beginning with the May 4th movement of 1919, when um, new uh, educated elites in urban areas of China uh, started questioning that huge, long uh, cultural heritage of um, traditional Chinese um, thinking. And Confucius being so prominent, uh, uh, being a part of uh, state orthodoxy for uh, since the late imperial era, uh, even going back to the Han Dynasty, which is contemporary with Roman times, he became a big target beginning in the early 20th century, uh, all the way to the anti, um, the criticized Lin Biao, criticized uh, Confucius campaign of 1971 uh, during the Maoist era. I remember first hearing the name Confucius when I was a kid and, and watching American television. Uh, the, this, this detective, this Chinese detective from Hawaii, the, uh, Charlie Chan, who would always end every every paragraph with a mm -hmm. with a quotation from Confucius. Mm -hmm. Do you are you remember? Do you yes, remember I, I watched. You know, I you know I'm came to the U.S. in 1972, so uh -huh. I missed a lot of Char Charlie Chan episodes. Yes, you did. I've watched a few. Um, yeah, there's uh, you know in the old days uh, people could recite the Confucian classics because. Mm -hmm. uh, much of their education was uh, memorizing the classics. Yeah. And so uh, Confucian wisdom and uh, philosophy was uh, in the minds of even ordinary people. Why, why should we remember Confucius? Why, what was, if, if, if it can be specified briefly, what was his contribution mm -hmm. to Chinese civilization? So today, why he's making a comeback 
uh, is not just because the government supports it, but ordinary Chinese people uh, want to revisit and re, uh, reflect upon and um, reconnect with traditional Chinese culture. A primary reason is that Confucius uh, said a lot of things about the importance of family. And uh, when you have a very fast-changing society, your family is your kind of anchor. And Confucius said a lot about the importance of family, uh, the loyalty to the family, um, respect for the older generation, uh, the mutual help of the family. So that's one thing. Um, filial piety, xiao, mm -hmm. is a, uh, a value and a virtue that's very much emphasized. But today in China, the hier hierarchical element of filial piety is somewhat downplayed because, after all, you know, China went through the Maoist era of radical egalitarianism. And in modern society, uh, we do emphasize more equal relations, and that is the case sure, for contemporary sure. China, too. Can you give me an example of what uh, Confucius said about family? What, how did he think the family should interact and, uh, and express that loyalty? Well, I think he emphasized the interdependence of the generations. Uh, that uh, the, the younger generation should look out for the older generation's welfare and uh, appreciate uh, what the parents uh, did to bring them into this world and to educate them. Uh, the other thing that Confucius really very much emphasized was education. And um, by education, he did not mean just book learning, but he also meant ritual. And so there was this kind of bodily component of ritual where you go through the motions of ritual and uh, performance of etiquette, everyday etiquette, and you, that, in that way you inculcate <coughs> these virtues and the consideration of others bodily into your habits, what uh, the French philosopher uh, theorist Pierre Bourdieu calls habitus. So, uh, he meant both ritual as well as book learning. And for example, um, I think about uh, a decade, over a decade ago, in the state of California, the amount of state um, tax money that went into education was overrided by the amount of state um, coffers that went into paying for the prison system. And I remember when that date occurred, I thought to myself, Confucius must be very upset. Because uh, during his lifetime, Confucius and his uh, disciple, Mencius, would always stress that uh, do not stress you know, solving uh, the crime and wrongdoing of uh, human beings. Do, don't rely on punishment and the law. Because that's already too late, because the crime has already been committed. You should uh, rely on preventative measures such as education. So, but education included, for Confucius, it included ritual. I mean, mm -hmm. In today's contemporary society, mm -hmm. um, maybe characterized mostly by secularism, mm -hmm. uh, ritual tends to be rejected. Yeah. Uh, why, why do you think ritual was so important for Confucius? Because in ritual you have the movements of the body, you have uh, each participant um, saying certain lines, and uh, just repetition of ritual for the, you know, annually or seasonally and so forth, uh, the bowing uh, to the ancestors and so forth, that will inculcate a certain demeanor, a, thir a certain ethos. Uh, that would generate the values, and it would be a bodily generation, I mean, uh, a performative. And so he thought mm -hmm. that was very important. Now, as I recall, um, people who, who wanted to uh, move up the social and economic and political ladder had to take examinations yeah. in China. That, those were largely about Confucius and his teachings, I think. Correct. The, uh, they were. Uh, so to be any educated person, you had to learn the fi five classics and the four books, the Confucian classics. You had to commit them to memory. You had to be able to write essays. And there you had three degrees. 
uh, in um, traditional China. Uh, most people could get uh, probably the first degree, but the second and the highest degree were very difficult. And uh, once you got these uh, high degrees, you could be assigned office. So the, these were scholar officials who staffed the imperial bureaucracy. So it was a merit-based system. That is, you, you took the examination, and if you did well, you were placed within the government. Mm -hmm. You had a role to play, and, and it was fairly yes. safe. Yes, it uh, wanted to um, make sure that the bureaucracy was staffed by educated, learned people who had the discipline to study, and it also wanted virtuous people who could display in their essay writing uh, and so forth that uh, they could be good government officials who would look out for the welfare of the people. Of course, that was the ideal. You sure. know, as always with human beings, the practice is often not so um, on target. Yeah, yeah, on target. Yeah. And and if you if you took the examination you failed, then what happened? You can try again. Of course, the exams were only open to men at that time. Ah, okay. That brings about one of the basic criticisms of Confucius that he was. Uh, basically male-oriented, but I suppose everybody at the time was. Well, you know, in the Confucian classics, uh, he mainly said that uh, men and women should have separate spheres, uh, women uh, with the domestic and men in the public uh, outside the home. Um, he really did not make uh, a lot of disparaging remarks. There is not that many remarks about women. Uh, there was one disparaging remark. But I think he, the, the reason why we have this notion that Confucianism is patriarchal is in the practice. So it's really not so much in the textual record. Mm -hmm. okay? So it's in the practice that uh, this is an all-male um, bureaucracy, imperial bureaucracy staffed by male officials. Uh, you also have an intensification of Confucianism, and uh, many modern Chinese scholars call it f Confucian fundamentalism, beginning in the Ming Dynasty, and that was about uh, 1368. So from the Ming Dynasty through to the Qing Dynasty, the last dynasty, uh, it was uh, kind of downhill for women. <laughs> um, but in the earlier period, it was somewhat better for women. And today, in fact, uh, uh, the revival of Confucianism, you do have uh, many uh, women scholars involved, and in uh, Confucian rituals, you have the participation of women in ancestor um, reverence um, rituals. I, I remember visiting the, the Confucian forest, mm -hmm. which is where all of well, Confucius and all of his descendants are buried, mm -hmm. but they're only male descendants. What happened to the female descendants? Well, China has always been a patrilineal society uh, where you trace descent and inheritance and your um, sort of family and lineage identity through the male line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, uh, that is the past. Uh, it continues to influence the present, and uh, especially in the rural areas, but uh, the 1979 one-child uh, policy or birth control policy, it's not literally one child because in the rural areas people are allowed two children if uh, the first one is a girl. Okay, So they, it's somewhat flexible in the, in the countryside. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Today, that birth control policy has made um, quite a lot of inroads uh, into this tradition of uh, privileging males. Because if you're a family with just a daughter or with two daughters, then um, you just have to adapt. And uh, increasingly, what we find is that the birth control policy has resulted in increasing gender equality in China today. So big changes have occurred. Yeah. Now after 1949, when Mao Zedong came to power, um, 
And there were a series of campaigns, including the Great Leap Forward, and, and most particularly the Cultural Revolution, where, where Confucius went out of style. And uh, students from Beijing University and elsewhere in the country were sent rummaging through the countryside, especially at the Confucian forest, especially mm -hmm. where uh, Confucius' um, home was. Well, in a sense, uh, because uh, China, uh, you know, modernizers in the 20th century of China felt that uh, China had to change radically. They were in a kind of crisis and emergency situation. You had Western imperialism um, occupying parts of China. You had Japanese encroachment in uh, Manchuria, in northeastern China, colonization, and full-scale invasion in 1937. Uh, so China it was in a state of emergency and they felt that China had to change very quickly. There wasn't the luxury of uh, kind of um, sitting back and debating and how should we modernize, how should we uh, deal with threats from uh, the West and Japan. They had to act. And uh, of course, uh, they went overboard. And I think most people in China recognize that. And that's why uh, now that China is increasingly more materially prosperous, uh, the people have the time to catch their breath and reflect upon the past experiences of the 20th century. And many people want to reconnect with traditional Chinese culture. Mm -hmm. And not just uh, Confucianism, but also Buddhism, Taoism, and in the countryside, popular religion. So, so all this, this is this, going on in China today. Th this transformation then, the need for transformation, is what for Mao must have justified uh, the complete rejection of the old and yes. in with the new, something like that. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Uh, at the time, there wasn't the luxury of, um, you know, debate and uh, scholarly study. Right. It was action, yeah. uh, and quick action. Um, and in hindsight, people can debate about what was done right and what was done wrong. Well, let's not do yeah. that here. No. <laughs> <laughs> let's instead turn yeah. to something else you just said, that there's also interest in Buddhism and Taoism. Mm -hmm. what, what is the role of these philosophies today in China? Well, there's a great interest in Buddhism because Buddhism has such a rich heritage of um, scriptures and um, uh, debates amongst uh, monks and also ritual practices and uh, popular festivals. So uh, at all different levels of society, of different walks of life, there's engagement in Buddhism, including scholarly engagement with Buddhist philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, the, of course, uh, you know, Buddhism offers a, a means of transcending our temporal life, our material pursuits, because Buddhism has a lot to say about human desires, uh, whether sexual or material desire or desire for fame. And it seeks to allow us to transcend uh, these desires, not to get so attached to these things of uh, our lifetime, which from the point of view of Buddhism, which takes the whole universe into perspective, you know, our lifetimes are, is just a tiny bleep, blip in the universe. Uh, why cling on to these desires that make us so unhappy? Because most of us can't fully realize our desires run away with us. Uh, and and uh, it's very unrealistic to just pursue that to no end. We should take time to disconnect ourselves from these material attachments. And yet today, um, the Chinese economy is, is very consumer-oriented. Yes. Uh, how and, does that and you'd be surprised because a lot of these very wealthy entrepreneurs and businessmen in China today, they're increasingly interested in Tibetan Buddhism because they've got it all and they still feel that there's something missing in their life. There's something empty there. Huh. And they go in search of spiritual pursuits. And do they find it? Well, uh, they're engaged in the pursuit. Um, uh, sometimes they take uh, up with um, Tibetan lamas, 
as their personal guru. Um, and many people also find gratification in uh, giving away part of their wealth, in making donations to build Buddhist temples or Taoist temples. Uh, there are people who also um, get enamored of Taoist teachings. Tell us something about Taoism that we may not know. Taoism um, believes uh, it's different from Confucianism in that it's not into pursuing um, morality, uh, establishing right or wrong, because Taoism adopts a perspective of nature. In the state of nature, which it calls Tao, the way, it's beyond good and evil, right and wrong. And so humanity sets up these binary categories and tries to live by them, but from the point of view of Taoism, nature is beyond that. And nature has its own um, rhythms and flows, and it's better for human societies to try to imitate and conform to the pathways uh, of nature, and, which is spontaneous, spontaneity, and operating by chance movement. And there's, a, 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 there's an idea that there's a certain rhythm in the larger cosmos that it's better not to resist, but to go with that flow and to orient human societies with that flow. So Taoism is very nature-oriented. It also believes that there is a stronger cosmic flow uh, that human societies should conform to rather than combat and steer. You know. how, how would Taoism treat uh, contemporary environmentalism? That is the exciting thing about Taoism, that more and more scholars are trying to link up Taoist philosophy with our important environmentalist um, consciousness today. So, um, you know, there, there are beginning, we see the beginnings of work uh, to, to sort of globalize Taoist philosophy, link it up with, say, the transcendental movement in, um, you know, Henry David Thoreau, Walden Pond, uh, Ralph uh, Waldo Emerson, uh, and also uh, with uh, Buddhist philosophy too, because, and also with deep ecology, uh, new you know, environmentalist consciousness uh, about transcending humanity, uh, linking uh, up with other species, thinking beyond species identity, uh, and, and uh, thinking of ourselves as uh, one amongst other living species. Uh, Buddhism has the notion of um, the importance of all sentient beings. Um, so there's this work uh, linking up Taoism and Buddhism, which is not so human-centered, okay, uh, with uh, the most kind of uh, postmodern uh, frontier thinking of um, ecological thought. So that is uh, starting to occur. But if we look at uh, the environment in China, mm -hmm. and in particular in Beijing, or yes. at Shandong University in Jinan, mm -hmm. uh, you look out and if you see the other buildings, uh, it's a very unusual day. Yeah. Uh, That's so, why the, so I, I yeah. guess the question is, you know, how does that square with, with the philosophy of Taoism? Is, or is it just now beginning to take root? It's beginning. Um, there are many scholars in China of Taoism and Buddhism who are in, beginning to be environmentally conscious. And that's why this is so valuable a turn to uh, reconnect with traditional Chinese philosophy and thought and culture because it's also practiced through ritual and through teaching. Um, and uh, it will help uh, China become more environmentally conscious, because China has been, uh, for the past uh, 30 years, been the, in this race to uh, become materially prosperous, and they've made this all-out uh, effort, uh, and they've in many ways gone overboard. 
and now uh, from top to bottom, from the Chinese national leadership to the ordinary person in the villages or in the factories and, and so forth, uh, they're starting to realize that they've got to uh, think about the um, consequences of the pollution. There's uh, air pollution, there's soil pollution, there's water pollution of groundwater in China. It's very serious for the future health of the whole population. Um, so there are efforts now. Uh, there's the beginning of consciousness, and I think it can only grow. It, it seems to me, at the risk of being contradictory, that there's a collision course here between what the government wants, which is an accelerated, a continued accelerated economic growth spur, and the view that the environment is somehow important enough to slow the other down. Mm -hmm. Do you see that collision course, or is it? Um, no, I don't see it a, a collision course because the government is changing its thinking as we speak. It has been changing its thinking. It's, it wants to promote more um, high-end kind of industries uh, that rely more on educated uh, labor force mm -hmm. and cleaner industries. It has been uh, closing down the coal um, smoke uh, spewing um, chimney type uh, 19th century style factories. It has been doing a lot of that. Of course, this basically doesn't solve the global problem because it just gets exported to Africa and Southeast Asia and so on, these kind of industries. But at least for China, which uh, the other thing is we do need to uh, think in terms of an interconnected world. We can't just blame China for all the pollution uh, because we in the West are enjoying uh, all the fruits of that because we've exported all this uh, um, production of consumer goods to China. China has become the factory of the world. We in the West enjoy clean air and clean water, uh, and China has had to pay for it. So I think uh, if we can help China uh, raise itself out of all those dirty industries to make their uh, population healthier, uh, it would benefit the whole world. And Chinese government is taking major steps. It signed a major climate change agreement with the Obama administration just last year. And that had a really great uh, impact of kickstarting uh, the climate change talks, uh, which are resisted a great deal in the United States, in Congress, as we, we know. Um, well, so there's almost, a lot of resistance actually in the United States I about think this. Almost everything is resisted by this Congress. <laughs> uh, thank you for being here and for helping us understand more about the contemporary relevance of one of China's great philosophers, thank uh, you. Confucius. For uh, Global Dialogue, I'm Peter Hasland. Good night.